Uh, greetings in the name of the Most High. I am here today. We're having a uh, um, special guest and uh, a book I want to make you aware of called Treading on Serpents. And uh, I need to say a couple things about yesterday and the cloned uh, behavioral uh, traits and patterns that are recloned and updated and, and uh, you know, mass, mass produced in humans to regulate behavior. Um, this this uh, used to be done by mythology. I mean, it goes back thousands of years, this kind of thing. And um, we exist on, you know, a lot of different levels, let's say. And on, a, on, on the, the main, it seems the main enterprise here from the very beginning of time has been the control of humans. And uh, so I went into that a little bit yesterday, and I, I had a, I didn't really cover everything that I had to, that I needed to cover, uh, but I did, you know, I was able to um, at least kind of outline it because, and why is it important, and this is what I forgot to say, it's important because you need to check to see that you're thinking your own thoughts and behaving your own behaviors. You need to find a way to do that. The only way I know to do that is in prayer, is to have the Lord check me. That's the only way I know to not be mind-controlled. I know of no other way, because everyone that I speak to out there thinks they're having their own thoughts, and they think they're living their own lives, and they believe they're doing, you know, and it gets more exotic when you get into, like, the occult and, uh, uh, you know, bloodline elites and so forth and chosen ones, and that's a whole other realm where entire families are created truman shows are created around a baby uh so they grow up thinking that they have a a life and they think they have a family they think they have a let's say a woman has a husband and children and a school and some schedule and if they're a chosen one that means they're going to be um eventually uh taken and turned into something else um I don't have any solution for that. I'm not even dealing with that. But I mean, that is another thing out there that exists. All this stuff is very advanced. Anyway, today the topic is gang stalking. Gang stalking from somebody that lived through this hell out in Los Angeles, Tina Plackinger. So I'm going to bring her on here and uh, and just say, welcome, Tina, first of all. I don't want you to just wait there. <laughs> How are you? Hi, Jeff. Hi, Trish. It's so nice to be here today. Good morning. Good morning. Very nice to have you. And uh, we're excited about talking about your book and your experiences. And, uh, well, uh, why, don't well you, why don't you read her little intro at the back uh, of the author? The author. Well, what I, what I want to do is just, I was just reading something in the book. Now, what the book is, it's called Treading on Serpents. It's a, this is great. This book is great. Trish and I used it uh, on the road. A lot. It Trish was would, very helpful uh, as we were and, traveling on the emergency ambulance down to uh, Florida. Right, because Trish <laughs> is very, very uh, has is quite, quite uh, whatever sick, if you will. But uh, we mm-hmm. used two books: one, Tina's um, Treading on Serpents, and two, Charles Spurgeon Daily Devotionals. Yeah, that night and day. Um, Tina Plackinger is an author and former world champion bodybuilder. In the 1980s, she was celebrated as an entertainer and trendsetter, having received awards for both best and most unique poser in the professional ranks of women's bodybuilding. In addition to competing and guest posing, she privately trained Warren Beatty during... Beatty? How do you say his name? Yes, Beatty. You remember. Warren Beatty. Hollywood. Actors. During the filming of Dick Tracy and worked as a spokesperson at U.S. military bases for Joe Wider's muscle and fitness products. Tina's work extended into television and film as she starred in Pumping Iron 2, The Women, played a recurring role in General Hospital, and had a supporting and stunt role in Armed and Dangerous in uh, 1986. As an avid and experienced <laughs> writer, Tina freelanced for multiple publications, including Muscle and Fitness Magazine and Muscular Development Magazine, and she also co-authored a monthly column with Dr. Franco Columbo, Columbo in Flex Magazine. Tina featured the current whereabouts and lives of former champion bodybuilders for Iron Man Magazine in her monthly column, Whatever Happened To?, 
She also received screenwriter credit for scenes in the motion picture Liberty and Bash, starring Lou <laughs> Ferrigno. Ferrigno, Lou Ferrigno. Ferrigno. Another bodybuilder. <laughs> Who's an actor. But all that changed in 2002 when Tina became a targeted individual within a nationwide underworld of gang stalking networks. She was coerced from her North Com- uh, Hollywood home to the South Bay area where she lived in a community enforced isolation. She eventually managed to escape in a stolen car with, her, with only her two dogs. She's a survivor of smear campaigns, legal corruption, oppression, thievery rings, and satanic worship. Treading on Serpents is her first book aimed at supporting other targeted individuals. The sequel is forthcoming. Tina Plackinger can be contacted at www.tinaplackinger.com. Okay. Very nice. Thank you, Trish. Yeah, Thank that's, you. that's perfect. Just a, just a little overview of the, the situation yeah. and why we are here today. Well, okay, so 2002. In 2002, that's when we, we were going through... That very thing, gang stalking, again, it kind of was more of a perennial with us on and off. But in 2002, it, it, it drove us out of Los Angeles. But you were driven into this the squalor of this Long Beach commu- community where they, you say they were, they were keeping you in a perimeter, like you couldn't escape. The, 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 you, 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 could you speak a little bit about that? I'd love to hear more about how you wound up st- stuck in Long Beach. And, unable and, and all that happened pretty much overnight. I mean, my my stalking wasn't something that was a slow uh, a slow thing that happened. Uh, it it was boom overnight. Everything just changed. Uh, I lived in North Hollywood, off of Laurel Canyon and Riverside over there, in a beautiful two bedroom. Uh, um, uh, rent controlled apartment with you know underground parking. I had been there for about twelve years. I knew nothing about Long Beach. I never went to Long Beach. I just uh, all of a sudden, just overnight, things changed. Uh, it started basically. Uh, my husband passed away, so I had been isolated for a couple of years. You know, just sort of rearranging my life, figuring out what I was going to do. And uh, I uh, went, uh, I guess, pretty close to Long Beach or somewhere I went to get the windows tinted on my Jeep. And I met a young man there, and we started to talk. I guess it was his business, or he worked there or something. And he had asked me out to lunch. We went out uh, to eat a couple of times. Things were normal. Nothing was really weird. Until I was paid a visit from a woman who claimed to have been his girlfriend. You know, guys get you in trouble when they don't tell you that they have a girlfriend. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Help. And then that's true, right, Trish? Yeah. You know, guys that don't tell you that they have a girlfriend and they try to sneak and play the field, you know, they get you in trouble. He didn't get in trouble. I did. Well, anyways, this is what I'm assuming happened. So uh, everything sort of changed. She paid me a visit. She was a nice lady. Uh, we talked. I was friendly. I was in the people business, so I never thought anything of it. Uh, and I had a nice place. I invited her in. I, I think we had coffee. And pretty soon after that, the police started coming to my door, knocking on the door at all hours, telling me that there were complaints. No. I lived alone. I was very wow. quiet. Complaints, things were weird. The maintenance man came by, somebody that I knew for 12 years, always friendly, wonderful. I was no longer Tina to him. He started calling me ma'am and, you know, had the big long face instead of the big smile. And everybody just changed toward me. And uh, I think I made someone mad. I think I made someone jealous. Uh, who knows? It could have been a tag team. Okay, you flirt with her. You go see. Okay, and then you go over there and see what she has, and maybe we can get all of her stuff. Because basically what happened was I lost everything. Everything wow. was stolen. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that that was the beginning of the nightmare. Things just changed overnight. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with me. Uh, people uh, in the industry that were my friends, uh, they just they didn't call me back. Things got real weird fast. This is like a, a and this replay. This is after you were you were hanging out, training uh, movie stars, and you know winning contests. And yeah, but what she's saying about all of a sudden it just all ends, and then that, that it all just ended. Did that? Did we not go through the same thing? Yeah. 
but similar. Uh, v- very <laughs> similar, uh, but, but continue, please. Um, let me ask you a question. You were in North Hollywood. I'm very familiar with Laurel Canyon and uh, and uh, Riverside. Mm-hmm. In fact, you mm-hmm. know, I like, know you like, you know, uh, and all the restaurants around there on Ventura Boulevard. We lived at one point, before everything got weird, I guess this goes back to 92, we lived up on... Um, up off uh, Laurel Canyon, up on Fryman Canyon, up in there, up in that area. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, I thought that was going to be home, but uh, apparently not. We, it seems we're driven out of everywhere, but it, that's like a 10-year period. But the North Hollywood police, I, I have to say that I know someone that was stalked by them. It had to do with uh, drugs, I think, and, and snitches and things, and that, that sorted underworld out of North Hollywood, and the, the police seem to be involved in it in some way. You know what I mean? And trying to mm-hmm. drive some people out of a couple of the neighborhoods. And then the, the stalkers work for the police, at least in this case. I don't know about in your case, but they seem to work for the police. I've heard you know, numerous stories about, about this, but one time the, he was running away from the stalkers, from my friend, and then, and then he stopped somewhere and off one of the trains that go to downtown L.A. and come back to North Hollywood. And he was mm-hmm. getting off the train, and the, his cell phone rang. Or he, he, you know, he was calling the police, on, I guess, on someone. And when he called them from his cell phone, this is before there was really that communication, they picked up the phone, and they called him by name, and they said, don't worry, everything will be all right tonight. And then, oh. and then he went home. Uh, unfettered he was not the central player in this thing he didn't he wasn't the one the, the prime mover here he was just collateral damage but the stalking was really bad it was really real 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 perpetrators uh one time he had to go into like a liquor store market type of thing and just and just stand in there in the light and they couldn't get him in there you know what i mean he had to just stand in there and they were they they followed him right to the door and they're waiting for him out and waiting for him outside, and that's all I can say about this. But I mean, you know, this is uh, all I know about North Hollywood is that uh, first of all, where you lived and on Riverside, there is a very nice place, and um, mm-hmm. every nice. every amenity you could ever want in that area. And of course, what what is that known for? Right next to Studio City, which is very close to all the sound stages, all the TV, all the. The stuff that you were involved in, you're, you, most people live in that area so they can have quick access to work. And, um, right. And that's why you live there. So, I mean, uh, it's fascinating. I mean, I want to hear more now. now so you, you, you pissed them off. They, they, they got you. Uh, they were stealing your stuff. And you're about to tell us about well, how. I got evicted shortly after that. That's what wow, happened. Perfect. They, they tried to displace you right away if they can get your if they can get you displaced that's the number one thing so they start disarming you and what was happening was uh there were complaints that were i i pretty much was evicted so here i am now evicted and uh i'm the thing that you were talking about with the police and the Mm. drugs and the Mm you know, snitches and all that, right on. I heard your show about that one time, and I thought, my gosh, she's right on about all this. But I wasn't aware of it at this time. I didn't become aware of this until I was in Long Beach. All my things were in storage. Uh, The storage, uh, I was paying storage, and my things weren't even in there. I mean, they have huge rings of people that work with the police and the sheriffs, and they're all in on this thing. But I didn't know it at the time. I was very, my life was very, uh, it was a broad life, but it it really wasn't. You know, I worked, I worked out, and I went to 12-step meetings. That was my life. I was really regimented. So I was clean and sober. Everybody I knew was clean and crazy. And, you know, we did fun things, and, and life was Life was good, but I wasn't somebody who really, I didn't date. I, I didn't do much of anything else. There was a little used bookstore up there on the corner of Riverside and Laurel Canyon. Mm-hmm. I went there a lot. I, there were certain places I went to. My, my, my life was very regimented. So I didn't know anything about crooked cops. I mean, I was raised that, you know, you're a woman, you have a problem, you're in trouble, you're scared, 
call the police and, and they'll help you. <laughs> this is how I was raised. Right, and right. I had a real rude awakening after all of this happened. So after I was evicted, I couldn't find a place. Well, of course, they were controlling all my Internet stuff, but I had no idea. And there was a place that would accept me and my little dog in Long Beach. And I thought, oh, boy, okay. I, I now call it Wrong Beach. And some people call it Strong Beach because it's, uh, you know, you don't want to be there if you're not liked. Um, so I ended up in Long Beach. All my stuff didn't fit in, in the apartment. Uh, I was so displaced. Uh, I put everything in storage, and just everything just went downhill after that. I, I met the, you know, I was so used to traveling the world, helping people. Uh, people looked up to me. I'm not bragging, but I, I could go anywhere, and they would ask me for my autograph. People liked me. I treated them like real human beings. I didn't have a, 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 a huge ego. Um, and it, I was in the people business. Um, suddenly people were really mean to me. They would swear to me. <clears throat> they were just nasty. And I pretty much spent a lot of time with my jaw hanging down, just shocked at how people were treating me. Mm -hmm. Well, but not everyone was in on it. They just well, it see, seemed like it. It it seemed like it. Like see, the there's that, that I had rented. See, there's that other component that I mean, because I've been studying this, in, you know, for, for since a teenager. So there's that other component where you have people all of a sudden spreading out more and more and more people doing the same thing, acting the same way, and you're wondering how could they be connected to back in North Hollywood. Um, wait a second, there's too many people participating. How do they keep it all straight? And uh, and that's that's where the mystery, that's the mysterious aspect of it. I'll just put it that way for today. And, uh, you know, I will I will continue to, to uh, you know, to, to look at it from many angles. But once it starts in, once it starts in, it seems to just go citywide almost, right? It, it seemed that way. I, I really uh, hardly ever went back to North Hollywood, so now I'm stuck in Long Beach, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't like the apartment that I'm in. Uh, nothing fits. Uh, my dog is old, so he's getting sick. He's a little miniature schnauzer. And, uh, of course, you know, I had to take him to the vet at that time and then put him down. It was his time. And, you know, I was very lonely. I was upset. Uh, seeing, I had no friends. Uh, n nobody liked me there. Um, it, I was just totally displaced and out of my element. And nobody took my calls. Nobody wanted anything to do with me. I was. It was like I was yanked out of one place and just put into this whole other world. And that's what happened. So here I am now, and I'm thinking, well, <clears throat> instead of being in my Jeep, uh, maybe I ought to get a motorhome. So I did the whole motorhome thing, you know, mm -hmm. living, and boy, did that get old fast. <laughs> you know, uh, it does. People walk, go by you with their thumbs up, and they're like, yeah, you know, they see you out there with a couple of dogs, and it looks real fun. But when you're living like that, and I, I resented that motorhome real fast. Mm -hmm. uh, because Especially, I knew nothing about camping. I knew nothing about yeah. anything. Well, you see, the thing uh, is, yeah, things just, break at a motorhome. They they break real mm -hmm. easily. So you have to be... And they leak. And they leak and they break and they the the engine and you've got the engine now, you've got your plumbing, you've got your electrical. Uh, a lot of places don't have hookups and then, you know, you can, you can and, and this part of the world here, you can freeze your tanks and then they burst and then you have to get another tank and blah, blah, blah. It goes mm -hmm. on and on and on. But uh, we, um, I sort of like it because of the fact that if I don't, you know, if they start in on me, we just... You know, we just fire it up and leave. <laughs> you don't exactly. get exactly. You don't get stuck in one place. You get to leave. Okay. Yes. So now, now, now you're down so how there. Long, how long did you live in the motorhome? I lived in the motorhome for about, I guess it m must have been two years down there. Uh -huh. um, yeah, on and you know, just uh, moving around. Basically, I was moving around with it, uh, uh, and so I was down there for about two years in the motorhome. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I got the motorhome, and then they would confiscate things from me as well. You know, 
they would they would I would go to like an auction and learn that whole thing down there and and uh, get something and then it, I I would be stuck somewhere on a side street and then you know, you you have to keep moving you can't be in the same spot more than three days otherwise you get ticketed or you get hauled off and it then it goes into a yard and then it costs you hundreds of dollars to get it out and then it's auctioned off to someone else so basically. For many, many years, I was being used for my things. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. But then then you said you couldn't get out of Long Beach, really. In the very beginning, when I was down there, and I'm in my Jeep, and I think at that time I might have bought a little trailer to pull around behind me. Um, And and I prayed before I, I, I got on the show today because... A lot of times when we tell our story, we get really scattered and we're all over the board. Uh And I don't want to do that. I sort of want to stay focused and then not get myself all overwhelmed either. Mm -hmm. So I have a little trailer and I'm pulling it around and I'm pretty much in an area of maybe eight, ten mile perimeter where if I went too far one way, like in Wilmington, uh, it, things would just happen. You know, my, my truck would either overheat or I would run out of gas or something. And I just, and there were always, you know, there had to have been. I felt it. It was weird. It was something new. I knew nothing about gangs. Um, but I, there, I was always alone with a thousand eyes on me. Mm. Mm-hmm. Always felt like there were a thousand eyes on me. Wow. Uh, I, I I went to the uh, feds. <laughs> I told them. I said, I think something is happening in my life. I'm I'm afraid that I'm going to be set up for something, and I'm terrified. I don't want to be set up and end up in prison or something. I'm worried. Nobody helped me. I showed them papers of my trailer that was stolen from me from where I was and now I had to go back and get the trailer and uh, a truck was taken from me by gangs down there and uh, you know you turned it on with a screwdriver so when I found it I used the screwdriver turned it on and drove away with it and I you know I just needed somebody to help me to know what was going on and, and nobody did nobody did I went everywhere. I, I went to the, the DA's office. I went to the police. I went everywhere for help because I felt that I somebody was going to either kill me or put me away for good. Or There were many things that were happening to me uh, where I could have been maimed. Things like pulling around my trailer, you know, have house will uh, travel, pulling around my trailer and you know, somehow in the middle of the night or maybe when I was in the store getting something to eat, they switched the ball out. So they put a smaller ball on there so that when I did drive out of the parking lot and hit a speed bump, the, the trailer would fly off the ball. Oh, my word. And if it weren't for all my chains, that would have been an accident or messing up the jack on the trailer so it would slip See? and just miss me. There, there were many things. And the, you know what? The Lord had his hand on me through all of that. He protected me so much, and and that's my message, and that was a lot of the, that's why I wrote about a lot of the stuff in the book, uh, only in the, in the introduction, you know, 21 pages of all the months. Right, right. Um, right, you, the, the thing is, is that... people... Go ahead. To show people the power of God, even when you don't think he's there working, you know, he had his hand over me. He really did. I... I, I you know, it sh- kind of shakes me up even talking about it today. Those are things that I like to sort of put in the back of my mind it, down the hall in a box in my library. You know, I don't want to. Re- and to even bring those things up, it kind of shakes me up a bit. But it's amazing how the Lord did protect me through all of that. Amen. Well, the thing is, is so that, yeah, amen. You found that out as this situation pushed you to the Lord, right? This pushed you to faith. It pushed you to, to surrendering to God. Did it not? I mean, this is, uh, it did to me, <laughs> but there was this kind of stuff you're talking about that drove me to the Lord completely. Cause I knew I couldn't beat it. I couldn't beat it. I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't, couldn't understand it. it. I can't beat it. And it's to this day. I can't beat it. If it starts up, I know what to do. Uh, you know, I go to prayer and I hand it over to the Lord because 
The one thing I learned, and this I hope to impart this to everybody out there, is that it's the Lord's battle. You hand it to him, and he, then you have to be patient and have faith, but I mean, it's his battle. This is his battle. He battles for Tina, he battles for Trish, he battles for me. That's that's the only way I could get through, you know, returning. And we, I've been back to L.A. too, and, um, and you know, driven up and down the coast and everything. And it's, uh, it's very, um, things have really changed. It's almost like, Tina, that L.A. is getting its own karma. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. that place is total squalor now. I mean, it's, it, mm-hmm. it, unless you live in Beverly Hills or Malibu or someplace you know, behind gates or in some gated community somewhere in Southern California, you know, in Temecula or some Rancho Santa Fe or someplace like La Jolla or whatever. Unless you live in some situation like that, uh, these gated communities, it, the, 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 but the minute you drive out of those things, you've got that, that squalor. You've got the, you know, from Palm Springs all the way into downtown LA and beyond, it's the, all the free, the I-10 freeway, it's all graffiti. I mean, it's, Used to be a little bit, but now it's just wall to wall. Tent city everywhere, uh, bursting mm-hmm. at the seams. Tent city all the way from LA down to San Diego, and all the way up to Ventura, mm-hmm. and all the way up to to Santa Barbara, and then all the way up to uh, uh, San Francisco. It's it's you know, and a lot of these people in Los Angeles, I, I I could not believe how many people were involved in this kind of thing that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I, it, it, when we were in mm-hmm. school, in high school, they were there doing it too. And then later, and then later again in the, my our 40s. And then I think, you know, and the, the goal is always the same. Drive them to suicide and laugh as they com- commit suicide. In other words, murder, a.k.a. suicide, is their stock and trade. And they think it's funny. These are sick people. And, and drugs play a, a big role in this. And, and not, not when I was in North Hollywood, but when I was down in, in Long Beach, I had realized that, you know, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of dope fiends down there. And they, I believe, were paid off with a fix. Uh, to come and say something to me, uh, uh, try to try to get me to, to sleep with them, uh, uh, try to take something from me that I had, mm-hmm. uh, whatever. Uh, they would come and I, I could tell that, because they were on crystal meth, so I could tell that they oh, were yeah. starting to nod, they were getting tired and things like that, and they would walk away very, very sad and disturbed when they didn't get what they wanted. It took me a long time to learn this, but... Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I was intuitive. I I, I did have uh, messages in my gut of certain people not to hang with, but it was a revolving door down there. I mean, they went, where one came in and left, another one came. I mean, I met so many different people down there, but the drugs played a big role in it, and good drugs. I mean, these. They, I mean, they. I, I think that uh, you know they were either being shipped through there, made down in those warehouses, the cops were involved. It was just huge and very powerful, and everybody wanted something from me. Um, yeah, it, a, whole, a whole other world. And I, and I tried to get out. I wanted to get out. I couldn't get out. Uh, I even talk about uh, my, my truck uh, uh, blowing up at the gas station. Mm-hmm. The gas station down there, I I just had um, a starter put in that morning, and I went to the gas station that night to get some gas and pick something up, and uh, I came out, and I got in my my Jeep and turned the key, and I heard this poof. It sounded like a a propane grill being lit, and I turned my head, and I looked, and I saw the reflection of my Jeep with me sitting in it. I saw the reflection in in the gas uh, station's window, and it was... I was lit up underneath. The whole undercarriage of my truck was lit. I mean, something you don't see every day. And I jumped out, and the guy came running out with his fire extinguisher, and then all of a sudden, within within 10 seconds, all these fire trucks started whipping in and cop cars. It was like they were waiting. They were waiting for this to happen. And I, I stood back, and I watched my truck burn, 
thank God that I left the dogs in the in the trailer a mile down the road. It it was just high drama constantly. But I was in shape. I was in shape, and I knew very little, so I was really naive. Um, I learned a long time ago when you're competing and you're up against the best in the world, you never let them see you sweat. And for some reason, I had this bag of tools. Plus, I was 19 years clean and sober, so I had a, another bag of tools, and I was had a lot of uh, spiritual uh, uh, foundation in me. So I, watching this stuff happen to me, and, you know, I'd like to say, well, you know, I didn't want to let them see me sweat like I'm a tough guy. Maybe I was in shock. I could have been in shock, too, and, and, and not have known it. But I just stood back and watched this happen. Then when everybody left, all the fire trucks, and I, I remember the, the one of the a female police officer, she was a young girl. She came up to me, and I was telling her that, uh, you know, I felt that the gangs were after me. I was I, People were after me, and she's writing this down, and then two older men, uh, police officers walked up to her, and she was trying to explain to them what was happening while she was taking this report, and, and they said something to her, and she closed her little notepad and walked away. So that was the end of that. Uh, oh, wow. Oh, it, it just... And then I, I, when uh, everybody left, when everybody left, I walked back there, and it was as quiet. You could just hear the drops of the water because everything was all wet. Nobody was in there getting gas. <laughs> Nobody was in the store. Nobody. It was almost like the whole area knew that this was going to happen. Or maybe this was something they saw on occasion. I don't know. But I could hear the water dripping. That's all no. I could hear. And I went in. I, I went inside. I stood there. My truck was sitting on four melted tires. It was scorched. No, all my laundry know. was inside. That was all wet and ruined. And a police officer drove up, and he got out and told me that I had an hour or so to get the truck off of the lot. Otherwise, I would be fined. Whoa. And so then I was on another mission trying to find somebody to help me remove this thing. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it, I was down there for a reason. I was on their turf. I was being punished, and I was just rolling with it. And... I got out of there. I got out of there alive. But I, I, I went through all that stuff for about a year or two, if, if, trying to remember, about a year or two. Everything is so meshed because you're on high drama and high adrenaline and you're in survival mode. Uh, it's always something. So And always um, drugs. To remember. The, always drugs that heighten the senses. Crystal meth is cheap. It's all over New Mexico. I mean, it's, it's a you know like a crystal meth capital, and so is Arizona and Texas too, I guess. But you know wherever there's these uh, interstates that run up into the country. But I mean, it's cheap yeah. to make. It puts people in a certain wavelength. I, I like to call it the devil's drug because it opens the portals of hell, and it and people that get yeah. caught up in it, they get into a hive mind, they get taken over by demonic spirits, and that that's one way I can describe the hive mind in terms of having thousands of people involved at once. You know, thousands. Not not three or four, but, but thousands, because I believe they get taken over by a certain entity that takes over thousands at a time. Then they may not even know you, but they operate in that spirit toward you, so they seem coordinated when they haven't been coordinated by a human, they're coordinated in that spiritual realm of hell, really. Because, I mean, the only I, there's a few things that lead to hell. One would be hallucinogens, you know, that like things like DMT. They, they're trying to legalize it now. <laughs> I, I can understand why. People get addicted to it because they want to go to this other world and see the, the aliens <laughs> or whatever. Um, demons. Yeah, see, they want to visit their favorite demon. They want to be taken oh. over. Tina, they want to be taken over. They want to mm -hmm. be taken over and taken care of. If they play ball with this reality, helping people to commit suicide, targeting someone and then taking them down and putting you know one person up against thousands at a time. You know, when they can do things like that. And then, of course, you know, now people are done more research into it and they find there's a mind control element to it. There's a you know there's neural monitoring and all that and that's been going on for many thousands of years actually because they have advanced 
in that other realm, in that spiritual realm, there is advanced technology, and I can't get into that here, but I'm just saying that, that they've, they've, all of us, all of our thoughts are pretty much mapped and have been forever. And uh, so with access to that information, they know who you are, they know what you think, they know what you like or don't like, they know, so they can say things like trigger words to you, like, I wouldn't go to the, let's say you're on your way to the, talk to the DA or something, I wouldn't go to that DA if I were you. You know, they could say something like that ahead of time. You go, well, how did you know about that? And then they walk away. You know, I mean, that <laughs> it's just mm-hmm. classic stuff like that. But, okay, so in getting out of there in one piece, and I mean, I get, get the idea. I'm, 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 you know, putting my own kind of experiences in with yours, and I, I don't mean to do that because, you know, at the time you didn't, you weren't aware of this, maybe the spiritual aspect of it, except that it was bringing you closer to God, which is so important. And then how did you get out of there, finally? Well, you know, it, it, the helicopters. They were, I have to mention the helicopters uh, yes. because <laughs> the helicopters were a really big thing. They, I, there were always so many helicopters. E- even when I was living, when I left North Hollywood, uh, went down to Long Beach, uh, contacted a friend of mine who was a veterinarian. We were, were all friends from the gym. And she and I, she invited me back to Woodland Hills. So I'm back in Woodland Hills with her, uh, and I'm, I'm there at, at her house, um, and the helicopters start. And it's pretty weird, and I, I don't know that some of them, you know, I'm outside with the dogs, and, and mm-hmm. there's a big helicopter that comes out of nowhere and starts flying around me. But I'm not aware, <laughs> I'm not aware that there's no wind there's no wind. I mean, I see the propellers and I can hear all the, the, the sounds and everything. And I tell the dogs, you know, again, not letting them see me sweat. So I'm staying calm, you know, come on, let, let's go in the house. But it, it, it didn't never dawned on me until much, much later that there was no wind. So these things were, I think there was a guy that was in special effects next door to me that might've been using something uh that made it look like there was a huge helicopter right above me but there really mm. wasn't it, it was there wow. you know like a projection yeah no like I've, a projector i have heard this uh i've also uh witnessed it myself but i've i've heard this from other people like there'll be a helicopter oh. there with no sound and then there'll be a helicopter with no wind or there'll be a plane in one case uh one person was talking about a plane and uh, the, but there'd be no, it'd be silent, and you know, mm-hmm. be, being stalked by these things. Now, now you're getting into the realm of real demonic warfare here with those helicopters. Mm-hmm. That's getting into, the helicopters. Yeah. yeah, that's getting into that realm, and and they don't have wind, meaning it's not really a helicopter, but you're seeing it. You're seeing yes, it. Yes, and believing it and, and just not, you know, not freaking out, but, you know, at, at, and, and then sitting in my room and, and, and hearing a, a freight train barreling through the back uh, yard, but there were no railroad tracks within miles of where I lived in Woodland Hills. You know, weird stuff like that that I knew nothing about. You know, mm-hmm. one night I was uh, there uh, in my room and I was playing Stevie Ray Vaughan very, very loud and uh, loudly cool. and, and, yeah, <laughs> so, you know, just trying to, just trying to chill, and somebody knocked on the window. Somebody knocked, and I'm sure it was. I always thought it were, were police officers or detectives because I was always being followed around by guys that looked like the Beach Boys. They just looked like the Beach Boys. They they were real clean cut, slim, had loafers on. And, you know, they were very clean, and they were followed me around everywhere. And it could have been the same guy, but he dyed his hair, or it could have been a number of them. But they would follow me around, and I had thought that I had seen one that looked like that next door. Mm-hmm. The little old lady that was in the trailer in the backyard next door in Woodland Hills, and it was a nice area. Um, she, I never saw, I didn't see her for a long time. And I'm thinking that she might have been swapped out with uh, a police officer, uh, a special effects guy, somebody who was part of the group. Mm-hmm. Um, so somebody pounded on my, because it was too loud, maybe they couldn't hear me. I would walk around the house and the ceiling would creak and follow me. Like there was somebody up yeah, in the attic. That's right. Wow. Well, see, all that's demonic you know. activity. That is supernatural 
stuff now. You're talking about, you know, black magic spells, um, shape shifting uh, people, and you know that that's a whole other realm of of study and and analysis that that I've been trying to deal with on the Zeph report for years. And even though I can get very into it and very into the deep layers of this thing, it's still I I can't solve it because the only way to solve it is for it to go away. And you know, it's here. We're here and we're picking up on it. And you know what? The average public out there, of course this this kind of convicts them because they either know about it and keep their mouths shut. Or they don't know about it, and they're potential victims. You know that that walking around not realizing there's a whole other world of danger out there, and it starts in you know with people, and then pretty soon it goes supernatural, and the, like you say, the helicopters, UFOs are another thing that that happens uh, that we've we've dealt with that, and um, we've dealt just just about every aspect of this, haven't we, Trish? <laughs> Trish is really not a targeted individual; she is more like my witness. Because I would say all this mm-hmm. stuff like you, and people would say, you sound crazy. And you realize, when I'm listening to you, I'm like, boy, and then no offense, but I mean, it's like, boy, t- you know, if you were somebody that just tuned into this show, and you don't know anything about any of this stuff, and you're listening to Tina and I go on, you're going to think we're both having what they call in the psychiatric terms a folie a deux. You're going to think the two of us are out of our minds. You're going to think we are completely mm-hmm. skitzed out. Uh, psychotic, schizophrenic. We need help desperately. When and it's true, we need we we we, we, we need help desperately. But this reality affects everyone on Earth. So how long uh, af- after you you got out of uh, the hellhole of Long Beach and you were back in Woodland Hills yeah. at your friend's house? How long did you stay there? You know, I don't remember the exact time frames. I think I might have been uh, with my my friend there. Uh, Gosh, maybe another, maybe a year. Uh-huh. And then I believe I, I, I ended up back down in Long Beach again, uh, trying to run a uh, business where I would go into uh, companies and water their plants and take care of their plants. Right. But, of course, all the plants started to die <laughs> at, at the Chevrolet dealership and over here at this insurance company. And, you know, somebody that I had worked for uh, gave me his business. There were maybe a dozen accounts. And I thought, well, that would be nice, you know, to continue this. And, of course, all my plants started to die. People started treating me weird and everything just sort of just yeah. everything just wow. went downhill. So um, uh, I'm... I'm in Long Beach again, and this is basically after everything is gone now. The the um, the my big my storage unit. I had two storage units. Things just you know, one of them there was a big uh, uh, pipe break, and everything got full of water, and they went through all my stuff, and just all kinds of stuff. And like I said, I don't want to get overwhelmed and then start talking scattered. So, no, no, I know. Okay, so they 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 got all my stuff. Okay, and now I'm. Uh, now I'm in Wilmington, uh, and I have a trailer, and um, it's not a Jeep, it's a Bronco. I have a Bronco. And somebody comes up to me one day, this guy, and he's talking to me. I'm sitting in the driver's seat, and my stomach tells me, because I feel a little movement under the Bronco, that he's talking to me, smiling to me, talking to me, keeping me in a conversation while somebody else is up underneath my truck. Oh, God. And, and then I thought, oh, don't, what are you trying to sabotage a friendship? Why, why would you be thinking stupid things like that? That's silly. And I would tell myself that. But sure enough, that's exactly what happened. He must have gone up underneath there and uh, emptied out my clutch fluid. So now I'm stuck. Now I'm stuck in a lot with the trailer behind me. And the cops are putting the you know heat on me that I needed to move. Oh, no. um, you know I'm yeah I'm disconnecting things. I'm strong. I'm able to you know get up behind my 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 Bronco, put it in neutral, and use my legs to push it. I'm pushing my stuff all over the place, and I'm able to do this. I'm I'm very much in shape, and I'm I'm very strong, and I'm still okay. So 
so I'm pushing things around, trying to stay within the perimeters of the law. So I'm not ticketed. Things aren't taken from me. They don't end up, uh, you know, uh, you know, taken away at the impound yard and stuff like that. Um, and then one day I, it was Thanksgiving, and I I was dirty. I was broke. Uh, I had the two dogs. Um, I was tired, um, and I just thought, you know what? I I'm done. I, I'm just done. I'm not going to fight leaving California anymore. I've been fighting this for two years. I don't have anything nice left anymore. Lord, if you help me. The only thing I ask of you, Lord, is that I can bring Mama and Pretty Girl, my two junkyard dogs, with me. That's all I want. I called my father. I said, Dad, I think... uh I think the mafia is after me, or I think something is after me, and, and I'm in a lot of trouble here. And my dad was very calm, and he said, well, you know, get on an airplane and, and come home. Well, home was L.A. to me. I've been there 25 years. Um, and I said, I can't, Dad. I've got two dogs. So, of course, then when Dad says no, I called my mom. <laughs> you know, I'm almost, uh, you know, I'm like in my 40s at the time, and my mom said, okay, we've got to do something. So we talked a little bit, but still I'm stuck now. I'm stuck like a truck. I, I can't I can't do anything. And I asked the Lord to help me. And I'm not going to say that the Lord helped me steal a car, but, you know, it was there, and had I blinked twice, I would have missed it. So, uh, you know, I jump in a car, and I, I take the dogs, and I leave everything behind, and I drive away with about a quarter tank of gas. And I go into a gas station, and I ask for a map, or I ask directions on which way do I get on the freeway to go toward Vegas, to go toward Nevada or Arizona. I needed to get out of there. And they were in on it. That was the weird wow. thing. The guys that were standing there told me to get on the wrong freeway. And when I drove away, I thought to myself, now how would they have, how would they have been involved in this? But they oh, were. yeah. And, uh, yeah, Confirm. I drove away, and there were, pe- there were people on bicycles, crystal meth people. They were, you know, they were on bicycles and skateboards, sure. the, the helicopters. I was pretty much escorted out. But I've got this stolen car with only a quarter tank of gas. I've got my two dogs and uh, some tools. Uh, I sold some tools to somebody somewhere uh, along the way in some desert town and, and filled up the tank. And I uh, just uh, got out of there, and, 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 and that's how I left. What did you do with and, the car? Well, I, I ended up at a, a place in Cottonwood, Arizona. There was a, a very kind Mormon gentleman that owned the place, and he was almost like he expected me or something. It was very strange, but I, I was tired. I said to him, I'm very tired. He said, oh, I know that you are. And uh, there was a little motor home there, and uh, it was just a little cheap little motor home. And uh, I said, my, my mom's going to help me get this thing because I've got 3,000 miles of travel, and I left the car with him. And then, this is, this is the kind of person I was. I wrote a note when I finally got back, and I was in the Midwest and all that. I wrote a note, sent the note to a restaurant that was down by the truck yards, in Wilmington with the man's name on there that it was his car that I took mm-hmm. and the keys. I know you did the right thing. I mean, they were desperate. I, I did that. You know, I did that. Right, I just, right. I don't know if it ever got back to the guy. I'm not sure, but I did it. Well, that was the right thing yep. to do. And it was also, you were in desperate circumstances. Survival mode. You had to get out of there. If you didn't, you might not have made it. So understood. Uh, Anyway, folks, mm-hmm. is that a big confirm, um, especially about how they're out in front of Tina? How they're out in front of you. Remember, I've been saying this for how many years? Well, and we've, it- got, uh, we've got nine of these books written by <laughs> Tina that we'd like to yes. give away yes, yes, to yes. listeners. Nine? Uh, I bought ten. Well, we have one that I, is I took, used. I took yeah. one, yeah. Trish took one. We, had, we have a hardback copy, too. That's I, also have, I have a very rare hard copy. Yes, Our, you do because you're special. You're very yes. special because <laughs> you know what? Eight, Eighteen years ago, when I got to Chicago, then I looked up. I didn't even have a name for it. I didn't know gang stalking. I knew nothing. I went right. to the uh, Barnes around, yeah. and Noble or something, 
I was looking up whatever I possibly could. I went into true crimes. I went into self-help. I couldn't find anything. Of course. So, anyways, I'm, I'm in Chicago. I get a laptop. Uh, I'm looking things up. There's hardly anything going on at all. So uh, I was pretty much alone. And then I decided, okay, get rid of the cell phone, get rid of, you know, and I hid out. I did. I hid out. The targeting continued. Uh, it was it was pretty bad for a long, long time. It's, it's, I, I'm still targeted daily. And um, it wasn't until about two and a half years ago. My mother's getting older. I had to come to Chicago, help her out a little bit, and I was miserable here. And I'm walking the alleys uh, with my dogs, and I'm praying, and, uh, you know, something comes to me to pull out that manuscript and dust it off and get it going. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the book is not all these horror stories. I wanted the book to be, because when I was in the 12-step programs and in my own recovery, all different kinds of 12-step programs, you know, we always had affirmation books. We, all, we always had daily affirmation books, and I loved them. And I thought, this book is not we love a them horror too. story book. Yeah, we love yeah. them, too. We, so the, the book uh. is 365 days of, uh, you know, you can get through this, you know, in these little stories and... Let's read yeah. today's. It's uh, encouragement. Trish, would you read today's? Sure. Or, t oh, Tina, if you right. have it handy, uh, let's let Trish read this because she's got her glasses and everything. And uh -huh. Yeah, I okay. do have it handy. Okay. Okay, let Tina read it. Okay. That's March even <laughs> Wait, let Tina read it, Trish. Okay. That's even better. Go ahead, Tina. <laughs> okay, March 14th. 14th. Many church people are just plain fake while hiding together under the hidden evil of dark spirits. Surely, they are spiritual fakes. There are spirits in the church that are not of God. They are not difficult to spot, those clingy spirits of heaviness and discouragement with sister spirits of oppression and control. However, the most mean, perverted, and demonic spirits are often found with the daily churchgoers those who read passages from the pulpit on Sunday mornings or assist, or assist the pastor in some way. Nothing is as demonic as when a T.I. reaches out in sheer and utter desperation, but no one from the church grabs hold of them. Right. It is beyond words, the pain of barely existing after a brutal assault with one parishioner ex without one parishioner extending a helping hand. This is the ugly underbelly of community gang stalking as it flourishes in broad daylight. We must press ahead and not allow Satan's demons to constrict us or weigh us down. With the all-seeing eye of God's Holy Spirit, we must make ourselves get up, pick up, and look up before we can shake this one off. Today's word, if it comes from Isaiah fifty four fifteen out of the NIV. If anyone does attack you, it will not be my doing. Whoever attacks you will surrender to you. Wow. Amen. That's, uh, Amen. Amen. That's today's reading. That's, and they're all different. Yeah. I quote you twice in the book, and I have you, wow. uh, the Zeph support, in the back under the resource section, because two and a half years ago when I came to Chicago and got back on Wi-Fi, I get, got the Wi-Fi and started to look at YouTube again and saw so many targeted individuals, I found the channel called Gangstalking Survival. And that man had a uh, um, a podcast of yours called um, "God Loves His Spiritual Warriors," and it was a three-hour cool. one. And it, it was you talking about things that I didn't think any man would talk about. And I listened to that. I fell asleep to it. I woke up to it. That's all I did with. And that's how I got turned on to. Zeph Daniel, Trish Daniel, the Zeph Report, and the dogs. And you have become a part of the family. Sure. Um, you know, we, we love you in this household. <laughs> it, I'm telling you, I, I needed to, I could have quoted you in every page, but I didn't. <laughs> no, I no, no, you no, on, no. On two. Well, and yeah. it's true that, mm -hmm. but, but you, today you hit on something I, I'm so happy you did, 
which is how they're out ahead of you. And you go, I don't know how they, you know, how they were waiting. And then you also had an angelic kind of experience where there was a guy waiting to help you, almost like he knew you'd be arriving. And that's also uh, uh, something to mention. You know, there is that aspect about the spiritual realm. And um, but I, when we met, it was kind of funny because the, when you know when we finally started talking online or an email, it was like I was mad at you for a long time because you didn't want me to sell a book, and that was you know you you, you had that interpretation. <laughs> and, and I said, well, well, it's it's okay with me. I mean, you know, I, I think you misunderstood. And are, are we cool now? She goes, yeah, we're friends now. Yeah, we're, it's cool now. I'm yeah, not mad yeah, at you. Yeah, yeah. She goes, I'm not mad anymore because I, I would say something like buy the truth and sell it not. And I was talking about me how i quit taking donations and you know um because why because there's like a little i don't know it's for me you know what i mean it was and really i was talking in general terms and people might have gotten the idea well i better not write a book or do this or have a patreon account which i'm not and i clarified that later i said that's my walk but your walk may be different there may be people that you know i mean when jesus was had his ministry, who was the biggest benefactor? Oh, here's the first question. The first question, okay? Trish, we're going to start doing the giveaway now. Yep. Yeah, okay, I got for the book now. I got to say, I got to stay focused too. Okay. So here, here, here's, the, here's the first question. Uh, you know, Jesus um, did not make it on his ministry on just carpentry. I think we all understand that, right? Who is the benefactor? Who list any benefactor of Jesus? And there's a few answers, and uh, we'll give a. Uh, th- that's the first question going into the chat room, I guess. Who uh, are the benefactors of of Jesus keeping his uh, ministry going financially uh, back in the day when Jesus was alive? Okay, so anybody. I missed the first part of the I'm question. I'm not watching the chat room, Trish. You've got to watch it yourself. No, I, I, I've, I've got, I've got uh, two books have been given away, and we've got uh, seven who? left. They didn't answer a question. No, we, they didn't answer I have it. a new question. Who is the benefactor of Jesus or benefactors of his ministry? That's a question That's I'm asking. That's me. Me. No, no. I've, <laughs> I'm talking about back in the day of Jesus... During the three and a half year ministry, who were the main benefactors of Jesus? Because he needed money, obviously, to keep Joseph going. Joseph of Arimathea. That's one. But who, who is the biggest benefactor? Who is the biggest one? A lot of people think Joseph, but I'm thinking it was Magdalene. Anyway, mm. just give the book away to anybody that said anything. <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry, but I blew the, I blew it because Magdalene came from. People don't really understand. Magdalene came from Magdala. From apparently, her family was involved in the fishing business, but a big, but they had a big stake in it, right? So, so Jesus needed her for her financial support on the day to day stuff of traveling, feeding everybody. You know, there was a b- pretty big operation. And, uh, you know, obviously someone donated the upper room on the Last Supper. I mean, there's all kinds of uh, things that Jesus was doing. Carpentry was not one of them during that period of time. Hmm. Okay? So, so, you know, he was not plying a trade. They say, well, Paul was plying a trade. Paul also had benefactors. And people, people try to make a case that he was, he was making tents. Uh, and, you know, what, you know, he may have been involved in making tents, but that's not enough to pay the bills, especially if you have a ministry involving multiple people. So I'm not against, point being, I'm not against people having, you know, doing whatever they do, however God leads them in terms of, you know, most people I know that are promoting Jesus are, you know, are on a kind of hand-to-mouth based on donations because they've, a lot of these people, like, they were out of work, they were, they were hit the wall, and then they started a ministry, and it kind of goes up and down. I know how hard it can be when, you're, when you have a donation, then you don't, then you do, then you don't, it's on, it's off, and you're just trusting the Lord for that provision. The Lord will provide. You just have to be paid. You, most of us get tested in faith, you know, and so the, there's no provision there, and then, then you worry. It's like, next time, and then it comes in, and then go, you know what, next time, I'm not going to worry. Okay, what do we got, Trish? What do you mean? 
Uh, okay, I'm gonna let's come up with another. Qu- <laughs> well, we're completely blowing this. Have you? How many books have you given away? Three. Three. Okay, so we have. Uh, well, we have. You've got three, so we got six left. All right. So, does anybody want a question, or do you just want to get the book for nothing? Which is fine. Get the book for nothing. I think questions are cool. I, I have a trivia. It's not uh, biblical, but I have a right. trivia question that might, you know, uh, lighten things up and, and be sort of fun. Good. Um, okay. Back in the day, <clears throat> Rocky Balboa and Rocky won. He bought two turtles from Adrian at the pet store. What did he name those two turtles? Oh. Oh, oh that's <laughs> tough. <laughs> Oh, gosh, I should know the answer to that. That was one of my favorite movies. Darn it. Mm-hmm. We'll see if somebody knows. That was the only movie that I have seen where people were literally up in on their feet for, for the last yeah. act of the movie cheering on a fictional character. I had never seen that before. <laughs> that Just like in a live boxing match. They're literally on their feet. What, mm-hmm. what, what an experience to go through in a movie theater. What, what an experience to be, you know, in that dark room with all these people, and they're so into it that they're on their feet cheering. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, people love the underdog. Yeah. You know, people love the underdog. And, uh, you know, I, TIs are underdogs. And, and, you know, the coolest thing is, is that we're, we're, so many of us are coming together. We're talking. I, I meet TIs that... Um, they have never spoken to another TI before. And they're like, my gosh, I've never... And it is. It's a wonderful thing when you actually reach out and people comment on your channel. And, and it's just really it's really nice. I mean, we really need this. Oh, yeah. Did Communication anybody, breaks the devil's... This breaks the devil's <laughs> chains. This, this talking like we're doing. Having... You know, it's so amazing. I have not spoken to you before uh, yesterday uh, live on the Correct. phone. And your testimony, I could fill in the blanks. And I could start a sentence and you could finish it. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Mm-hmm. Isn't that mm-hmm. something that our experiences are so similar? And, uh, y- you know, and, 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 and so, you know, a lot of times, I guess people, before the word T.I. was out there, they would be the persecuted. Usually people that follow Jesus would be persecuted. Uh, also, Jesus referred to his people, his his people that, that got the call, as being the meek or being lambs. Lamb. So I called everybody the lambs before the word "ti" was popular, and it, they all went through the same experience. In other words, you know, they've they've everything dried up. Uh, people quit talking to them. People that were nice suddenly turned mean, and it all had to do with this spiritual call. They might not have even known Jesus yet, but see, there people start acting like you're there anyway when you're not yet there. You see, and then and they're acting and they're persecuting you though you're not there. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, and this is really key. You know, bless those who persecute you. You know, now I That's know hard sometimes. I know it's very really hard. I know. I know. <laughs> I, I I've had I've written scenes like in screenplays and stuff. Where they, they just go on a shooting spree shooting the perps, you know what I mean? Just like a hundred perps down. Just hamburger meat. Okay? <laughs> hamburger meat. And boy do I love mm-hmm. writing that stuff, but I know I can't keep that in my heart. Because, you know, I, mm-hmm. I still carry gr- grudges from, cause this is not my first rodeo. I mean, this is the latest round in, in, in persecuted people, but mine started back in the second grade. <laughs> And I, mm-hmm. I remember all those people and all those faces and all that mistreatment all the way back then. And I remember one time I was cutting myself in front of people uh-huh. at a party. And I was just like, you know, they were daring me to commit suicide and, and cheering me on Jeez. and wanting me to cut uh-huh. deeper and deeper. And then finally, you know, uh-huh. I wound up, you know, pretty much t- <laughs> hauled off by the guys in the white coats after that. But the point is, is that I, re- you know, I never forgot that. I just started acting what, I just started wanting to be what they wanted. You want me to be a freak? You want me to, what, well, you want me to cut my wrist? You want me to cut my neck? You want, what do you want me to do, blow my head off? You're going to cheer it on? Oh, here. And, you know, and uh, what I couldn't believe was like a game of chicken. And I survived. But what I couldn't believe was how they cheered it on 
friend mm-hmm. people that were friends before and you know people you'd had lunch with and people you know you played uh you went surfing with or you you went to the the, the concert with or, you know people you went to school with and then they turned into cheering on you know i guess they would also cheer on gang rape of of girls and and everything else they must mm-hmm. cheer every every damn thing on but i mean that they would target you and then and then they all play the game together a hive all one speaks the other mm-hmm. pops up the other pops up the other pops up one of the parents pops up the cop down there pops they, they just keep popping up in the in the scenario and uh with with this idea of oh i'm going to kill myself i feel so dead really you are oh please do what do you mean, oh, please do? Well, that's all we're waiting for. My God, you haven't done it yet? What are you, chicken? Gross. It's, yeah, that, it's, on, it's on that level. Yeah. You know it is. Well, you know, people, we, we, we do things, uh, we, we want to be loved. People just, you know, that's the bottom line. We, we want to be loved and we want to be accepted. And, and 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 that's on the 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 side of you know you cutting yourself and that sort of thing you know you wanted to be accepted you wanted to be okay. accepted part of and and the other people that follow you know it's follow the leader I, you know I've noticed that with neighbors they all like get together like it's like it's fun and yeah. it, everybody wants to be a part of something right. and it's very hard to stand alone. You could, and here's don't the other. Want to stand alone. Here's the other end of it. And if they don't join in with the gang, then they're next. So it's uh, you see. Good, so so good then point. there's that. There's that too. And I'd just rather stand with the people who stand alone. I mean, I didn't. I was very immature. I mean, I admit that cutting thing and you know trying to be a martyr and you know doing it on purpose and giving them what they want and flaunting it in that way, flaunting my victimhood. Um, in order to make a point. The point was, at what point does your conscience kick in, gang stalker? At what point do you have a conscience? And the answer is, they don't. Probably after, you're, yeah. after you blow your head off and your brains and your skull and, you, and, and blood go all over the wall, right in front of them, at that point they go, oh my God, did you see that? And maybe when they get older and they sit there thinking as they're just about to die and they got cancer and they got every other thing and everything has gone wrong and they're sitting there th- and they're thinking, my God, I caused that guy to blow his brains out. I really feel bad about being that kind of a bully. Oh my God, that blood is on my hands. You know, at one point, and they're either going to repent at that point and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. Or they're going to think, that is so bad what I've done that I can't be forgiven. And they basically will themselves to death. And I've seen that over and over and over and over with these people wanting to die because they feel so guilty about the things they've done to be accepted in society, to move up that ladder. The, 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 the price that was paid and the, 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 the string of bodies all over the place and that's, you know, on them, right? And then they, they eventually come in contact with it. I mean, the good ones will repent. I suppose the weak ones and the, the, the ones that are really evil, I don't know, that are maybe they're cowards. You know, they don't, they don't want, you know, the, the bad things to happen to their kids or their grandkids, so they go ahead and not, so they don't repent. It's just the opposite. If you repent, your grandchildren and children will be blessed. Don't you understand? It's the opposite way you're thinking. You're just afraid of man out there. I don't know. I better not repent because I don't want to hurt my kids or my grandchildren. Wrong. I better repent so God will bless them. Man may curse them. So what? If God blesses them, no man can curse. Mm -hmm. Why don't they understand that? How hard is it to get that through to people? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, dying in vain. If you die with fear of man in your heart and, and, and with all that guilt of, of those transgressions that led to people's deaths, uh, innocent people that you just decided to target because you could. If you die like that, well, let's just say that's karma, I guess. That's your just reward. I've, but uh, the Lord is saying, I mean, if there's any education out there, the Lord is saying, I am here for sinners, I have died for sinners. Do you plead the blood because of sinners? You accept me and, and for the forgiveness of sins, and I am real. I am Jesus. You know, it, it's it. I'm here. For, I'm not here for perfect people. I'm here for sinners. What about these guys in the Bible who got people killed? David got people killed. 
A lot of people got people killed. They lied. They got people killed. Mm -hmm. They messed with the occult. They got people killed. They messed with witches. They lost their kingdom. They made mistakes, but they were forgiven. So, you know, all that had to happen was them to acknowledge what they did wrong. That's all. Mm-hmm. Is that so hard? Okay, I caused someone to commit suicide. We gang stalked them. I mean, that's a new term, but I mean, we persecuted them. We harassed them, and then they committed suicide. You know, I feel guilty about that, Father. I'm I'm wrong. I confess and I repent. You know, I repent. I'm sorry. When I did it, I I wasn't sorry, but now I realize I was wrong. And that's it. That's all it takes. I guess that's just too much. Right? Because if somebody repents, like someone down in the uh, LAPD in North Hollywood or somebody uh, in, the, in the drug business in Long Beach or somebody uh, in, any, in Hollywood that's uh, been, um, you know, using that casting couch to, to a point of destroying people's lives, there's a, you don't have to kill someone to destroy them. All you have to do is abuse them sexually when they're children. That will destroy them. Mm. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. i mean they may act sophisticated like whenever you see these kids they're like they act like they're 40 when they're like you know eight or nine and they act they, they, but they're very sophisticated when they talk i always wonder uh you know if their youth wasn't ruined by somebody you know that they that they emulate the adults because that's what what's happened to them i mean i can't prove anything but i mean i i, I always had that question in my mind Okay, so Tina, where do we go from here? We got this book. We we need to give away more books, Trish. Yep. Uh, we can also save it for people well, that, that are in the... We've in- got... Uh, okay, Anthony, I got that, Addy. If you want to delete it now, that'd be cool. Uh, we have five... Let's see. Mm-hmm. Five books left. Okay. And you know what? A lot of the people on the YouTube are probably going to want this book. Well, I'll keep five. Let me keep five. We've done the chat room. Let me keep five for the YouTube uh, commenters on YouTube. If they want it, all you have to do is it'll be first come, first serve. Uh, that's the way we got to do it. So you just chime in. I want Tina's book, and, and, and I, need okay. your ad- I need your address. But the, the okay, book. Okay, now we have four left. Okay. Four left the, for the YouTube. Oh, fantastic. Okay. That did, book- anybody, did anybody. Did anybody name the two turtles? By, by nobody. Name? Everybody loved that movie, but nobody came up with a name. What are their names? Okay. Cuff and Link. Ah, ah that's what I remember. Cuff and Link. Okay, so... Cuff and Link. So here's the thing. Okay, so regarding the, uh, the book, this book belongs... Every single person that's had any experience like this, persecution, targeted individual, gang stalk, any of these related topics needs this book to not have this book is a huge uh almost you're doing yourself an injustice it, how much is it tina for if they buy it at amazon i think on amazon they're selling for uh geez i'm not really sure maybe 32.95 uh freezing press uh has it for um 24.95 okay well, the book is a book that you use every day. You know, we, like I say, we have two books on the road that we use, and one is Charles Spurgeon, uh, I think it's Morning and Evening Devotionals, and Tina Plackinger. That's, that's, and those, those two are vital, right? Because Tina is talking our language, you know what I mean? She's one of us talking our language, so we understand the language. And then Charles Spurgeon is just a very excellent writer and very inspiring uh, the words that he says too. It's it kind of he's almost like referring to the Bible, you know. And uh, I guess he was a writer in the what is it late eighteen hundreds or something. I, I didn't you know he was long time ago. Uh, but uh, those devotionals that he put together, they're encouragements. And then Tina's every Thank you. every day that you read one of Tina's, it's an encouragement. To no matter mm-hmm. how hellish your world is out there, no matter how stalked or how. You've heard about, you know, sabotaging the car, not being able to get down the road. And you remember me, I used to talk about we had the whole front-end differential um, fallout that if we were going more than 30 miles an hour, we would have been dead. We had the guy, this guy was popping our tires. You know, this mechanic would keep putting, you know, I mean, we've gone through that whole thing too. with the, Anyone who's gone through anything like that, 
needs this book to keep the faith strong because all these you know events in your life are also tests testing your faith because you have to keep that faith strong because otherwise our thinking goes in the toilet and then we're living in our head and uh, everything our our perception of everything is is off i mean it's true i mean targeted individuals it rains outside and we take it personally we think everything is about us we think that you know everything that's going on is is because of us and i i find that with there's a psychiatrist a female psychiatrist who has just recently befriended me she's a target uh, again going out with the wrong guy wow interesting and, um you know it, oh, oh that's a big thing and um you know she uh too thinks everything you know is about her as well trained as she is with the mind she's it's new at this. something that goes along with this she's new at this that's that's the problem what happens is you get traumatized and then something happens in the world that's normal, that's not stalking, but then it triggers the prior trauma that you haven't cleared, and so it creates mm-hmm. the event over. It's like Vietnam veterans and veterans of the Gulf War and the Iraq and the Afghanistan wars come back and have PTSD. They relive the horror. Something triggers mm-hmm. so, something normal that has nothing to do with being back in the battlefield, and they're back in the battlefield again. That happens to TIs have- all the time. That's correct. And they have places that they can go to. There's organizations that help soldiers. We have nowhere to go. You know, it's not like we could just call up the, you know, the the, the VA or, or something and say, hey, you know, I have PTSD and I need help. There's nowhere for us to go. Uh, we have uh, these communities. We have uh, your mm-hmm. channel. We have, you know, mm-hmm. like this book. Uh, I, I, no, I book every a, day. Yeah. And your channel with an affirmation or a scripture to focus on. If we have nothing to focus on all day, honestly, our, our you know our minds go into the toilet, and then we're we're back to the races again. Crazy. I've, I've done that's happened to me a lot uh, over the mm-hmm. over the especially when I get tired. When I get tired, I seem to then go into my own thinking, and uh, I start feeling like a, vi- a victim of everything. I need that rest. I found some help with, uh, you know, just some practical help out there. CBD oil has helped me, you know, calm the anxiety a little bit. And oh, help, that's nice. It helps with sleep. But I found that I've, I just ordered some that's really strong because it helps with pain as well. I think it will help Trish. But that's kind of a blessing we've had that CBD oil has been made legal. And it has no effect on you. It has no THC. So there's no effect other than the, just the medicinal benefit of the oil and the, the, it's good for the, the br- brain. Uh, when I'm rested, I seem to be much more uh, positive. I have more faith. But when I'm tired, it just seems that uh, pretty soon I start taking everything personally. You know, like you said, it rains. And, and there's that thing called HALT, H-A-L-T. When you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, yeah. you need to HALT. Because those things do affect, I learned that back in the 12-step programs, all these little things. But, you know, when you're, when you're targeted, those, that's your bag of tools. We have to have tools, whether it's a Good. book or it's a, you know, little H-A-L-T. Oh, gee, I'm really lonely today. Um, I need to halt right now. Or I'm hungry. Hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. I need to eat. See, targets, we, we have to take care of ourselves. Hungry, we angry. We have to somehow try to, st- we have to, we have to try to stay in shape, too, and not just lay around, which I'm guilty of myself. I can stay, you know, just laying around doing nothing, and then, I, and then my head starts to get twisted, and uh, sometimes I have to open up my own book and, and read it, and it sets me back straight again. Amen. Let's, uh, uh, let's give out her her address on uh, where they can reach her on the YouTube. YouTube and she's uh, on YouTube. You can get her there. Yeah. Okay, your YouTube channel, Tina. You know, I don't have a name for it. I I'm not that. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to do that yet. Just I Tina Black. And you know, you can. You can click my face there on the comment section, and it'll take you there, but I don't know how to do anything more than so that. So if you go to I, the Zef Daniel, Daniel YouTube and click, and she makes comments there occasionally, so if you click on her picture, it'll take you to her page, but isn't it like Tina Blackinger when you just pop up at that point, or or not? You can go to my website, uh, 
Okay. And then there's a vlog area on the website. Okay, that's how they'll do it. Tina Plackinger okay. dot Tina Plackinger dot com, P L A K I N G E R. Right. Perfect. P L A K, not not yeah. C K. If people sometimes they might want to put Correct. a C in there, right. so it's P L A K. And uh, go to tinaplackinger dot com, and then you can from you know everyone's easy to find these days. So you can just follow the links around and get to her, and uh, eventually get to her email and. Uh, what not, but, but before you bother her, get the book, <laughs> That's, you know, get the, get the book before you ask questions because it, it's going to answer a lot of questions. You know what I mean? A lot of questions. And que- I do read, I do read the, the, some of the, I, I, you know, I do the reading on the YouTube channel. I do read out of the book, um, I think that you had mentioned that. I'm not sure if you just mentioned that or not. But I've, I've seen, it. I've been there. I've seen your your videos. People like it. I like it a lot. You mm-hmm. sit in a little chair and you got a little background there, and she walks. <laughs> the camera's running, and she walks into the frame, and sits down, <laughs> and then she reads the devotional for the day, which is cool, especially if you just read it yourself and then you see her reading it. Then you get a double, you get a a double dose. But look, this is self help. This is one of the first key, I guess I use this word a lot, kiosks. She's one of the first kiosks for targeted individuals to get self help, to get help. We need to do a whole thing on PTSD because I'm realizing now, and that CBD oil helps with the PTSD. But the PTSD occurs when, again, you have past trauma from this experience and you're kind of, you know, you've put it behind you, but something normal triggers it and then you think you're in it again. This is very common and, and people make mistakes. They go, by targeting was so bad they did this, this, and this, when in actuality you relived an earlier experience and you put that, you projected that onto the people around you. I've done this. Where I, where I screamed at these people at the dinner table. I'd scream. I'd say, how dare you do this to me? And stormed mm-hmm. out. And I called them all assholes. And I stormed out of a dinner party or something. And I've, this happened to me. And I didn't, and then, then they wrote me off as crazy and never got invited again, obviously. But the, the, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But I mean, that, I remember that happened. Now, how did how did it, sure. came, it came over me? And I couldn't help myself. It came over mm-hmm. me. I mean, they were passing around marijuana, and you know, I didn't know these people very well. It was my wife at that time that knew them, and uh, so there I am, and suddenly I get triggered, and I think they're all in on it, and they're all making jokes about me, and they're all talking about me, and they're all looking at me weird. You know what I mean, and then and then um, and then it, it just I you know I'm not the kind of person that just slinks out of there. You know what I mean? I cause a scene. <laughs> I'm not. You know what I'm, not, I'm like a like a like a the. You know I just I can't help it. I just really was so convinced they were doing this, and now looking back on it, maybe they were, maybe they weren't. But I mean, you know, I just started screaming at the lot of them. And looked like, and and I've seen other people do this too. Once we were at a MUFON meeting for um, UFOs, and this was about uh, an abductee being deprogrammed and uh, involving um, uh, child abduction and abuse and rituals done in a church uh, with UFO abductions. Okay, there you go. And this one woman Mm. next to us, I'll never forget this, Trish. Trish was with me. This one woman next to us, she just explodes and screams at the whole room. It's like thousands of people in there and just screams and goes storming out of the place. And so I knew she got triggered and something, some trauma, somebody not on their own. I mean, you know, and and what what has stopped this kind of thing of yelling at the whole group? It's it's gotten better for me because I'm able to discern the difference between real and not real, you know, but back then, you know, nobody wants to, say well i'm mentally ill i you know because then you go away for a long time no you know or you get put on medication or you become a zombie whatever so of course i'm of sound mind uh people with ptsd uh from traumatic experiences in the past are mainly of sound mind but they need to clear that trauma my method is to go back and relive it and and realize you know replay it like how would i play it today and um, 
you know, then, then it has no power over me. You see, it's not like I'm a victim. I go back and I say, this is spiritual warfare. I bind all these people in Jesus' name. You know, I mean, I would replay it, but, but with a positive outcome rather than me running from the place trying to find a hiding place. Or like you were, the other day, you had that word of slow down. When you see it, it's all circulating around you. S- slow down. Slow well, it's down. like her halt. It's yeah. like halt. There's another one, Tina, where it's like, if you slow down, it will help. In other words, maybe you can't halt at that moment, but you can slow down. Right? Yeah. Slowing down is good. I like that. So I've had to do because that. Because sometimes we, we, yes, instead of getting into that, you know, that frantic thing, I got to do this, I got to do that, and if I go over here, and then I got to get it, but, 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 if, but if they fix it with their right hand, they're going to break it with their left, so I can't get the car fixed, and then I have to, yeah, and we get like, <laughs> like, like, we're, being, like we're being chased yeah. by soldiers or something. Yeah. Slow down. That's nice. Slow that's down. Nice. Slow down. So yeah. that's, that's something that I did the other day, because it did start going off, uh, you know, it starts with supernatural stuff. You know, the cars getting in your way, people in your way, but it's happening so many times in a row that it, it's not really odds anymore. It's like, okay, and then the Lord will say, okay, it's on, right? And then um, wh- one time I was in a, a guitar center playing the drums up, and I was testing out a drum kit. Um, I think I was testing out an electronic drum kit. I never have liked electronic drums, and I still don't really. But uh, I was trying one out, and then I'd been there before, and these guys targeted, these two guys targeted me. They, what the guy does is he sits down, he's, he doesn't, you know, because I'm playing, I'm trying to hear how these drums sound. He sits down in a, in a big acoustic kit right next to me and starts pounding, and he sounds awful too, pounding and pounding and pounding and interrupting me, not letting me hear what I'm trying to hear. And so I just was like, the Lord said, hey, it's on. This is a full-on attack. And so then these two guys came over like they were going to uh, attack me, beat me up. They started giving me a lot of uh, crap. They started, uh, you know, saying trigger words and phrases, and they just started in. They just started in on me. And so what the Lord had me do is, because I'm very strong in the faith right here at that moment, the Lord had me deferring to them, like complimenting them. And saying how, how wonderful it is to have a place like this to look at drums and how good a job they're doing. Mm. And it completely disarmed them. Stop the whole thing. <laughs> I bet. I walked yeah. right out of there, pretty as you please. Walk, th- up there it was in Sherman Oaks. I had to walk down the stairs and then out through the guitar section. And it was like, hey, bro, yeah, okay, have a good day. And, uh, you know, I was in my car. The, you had parking in the back and uh, got in the car and just drove away. Without any mm-hmm. hair on my head. See, because in a situation like that, if they had you alone, if there was a, no way, if there's a way to get away with violence, they could possibly kill you. Uh, I don't know how mm-hmm. deep they were into it, but, but, you know, there are quite a few murderers in these cults. And, um, you know, if they can get away with it, you know, it's a, it's a poison to the drink. You know what I mean? There's, it's, there are little ways they have of just pulling, pulling the plug on you. And you need mm-hmm. the Lord's protection. Now, did I ask to be targeted? No. Did I ask to be born? No. I didn't ask to be born. Only three books left. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, YouTubers. Oh. Well, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We'll do another giveaway just, just for the YouTube people. We'll just do another 10 for YouTube. But the main thing I'm trying to do is get this book in the hands of every you single the person. Out. There are people. There's a, a, a guy in the chat who uh, who is... Uh, in LA, and uh, oh my God, he, uh, he prayers. Wants, he wants one of the books. We, we got it for him. Yeah, you got to get it to him because that's like his lifeline. He, he uh... <laughs> <laughs> if you're in LA and that's you don't have you, you have to have this book if you're in LA. He because says, wonderful show with Tina. If there's a book, I'd like one. I work with homeless community at a food pantry. Oh, perfect. Where I volunteer in West San Fernando Valley. I can relate to the gang stalking and the TI phenomenon. I did not know there were names and labels for this see it's uh, uh, tell that's brother hey bro look this is it's before all that got going back back say in the 90s you know and the and the and the the early 2000s we called it just persecution you know what i mean it was just like spiritual warfare we call it and uh and people manifest i mean frankie and i remember in the early part of the show we'd have the z and frankie show and that was a lot of fun and you know, whenever there'd be a... See, and Frankie in the morning. Yeah, God, that was fun. Those are the days, huh? But anyway, 
we we'd have a thing where like people would be you know nice they'd be on the show they'd be real nice and if they were really nice frankie would go well i wonder how long it'll take them before they manifest you know what i mean now because they're being nice that means to him that meant that it won't be long before they turn on you <laughs> it, would, it would happen all the time you know they a lot of times people come around with flatteries Oh yes, and then and you know they're going to turn. You know they're going to put a you know knife mm-hmm. in your back at some point. You just know it because the devil loves to use flatteries. So yeah. uh, so I tell you, people, what you got to do when people flatter you like that, they you know you got to be really careful because flattery is a much more dangerous threat than just because you know when you talk straight to people, it's like hey that's a. That hey, that uh, you know, people say that track you did, that's pretty cool, or that video you did, I like that, or that show I listened to, that's cool. You know, that's that's okay. But when it goes into a little more than that, you got to get your flags up. You got to go. Okay, go. You go right into prayer. You hand that over to the Lord. You go. The the devil likes to win the to conquer the kingdom of God with flatteries and uh, and appeal to people's egos. That's why God breaks us because He doesn't want us to have an ego. That can be pumped up by someone because you get, you know, you're beaten down your whole life and someone likes something. You really like it. Oh, I really, really like it. You're a genius. I'm a genius. You are the best that I've ever seen in my life. I'm the best ever. Really? Wow, that's cool. I want to have you around for the rest of my life. You know, you, you know, the next thing you know is he is false. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I, yeah. but you were so nice two weeks ago. And now suddenly I'm yeah. false. And you see, oh, man. And Frankie was on to that back then. He was on to that pattern they use. I mean, I'm a fan of, like, I, I'll tell Rich Keltner, you know, I, I really, you know, love this track that he did or uh, that track that he did or whatever. I, I give him, you know, not, not, not fake, fake flattery. I tell him when it's good, you know. And, and I know Rich is... He's got this New York thing where I say, hey, that's, that's pretty good. He goes, I know. <laughs> but in a way, that's actually better to do what, to just say, I know. Like there's nothing you could say that would put, be at the level that I think of myself. And, uh, and, and that's actually a good way to undo any kind of false flatteries. You go, oh, oh gosh, this is the best I've ever seen, Zeph. I know. Thanks. Next, you know, and it or, keep- or they or they give you a gift. That that was something that was happening to me yeah, a lot. Yeah, or a donation people would come into my life, and they would give me a gift. It started with a gift of anything: a little bracelet, a little trinket box, something. It's those gifts. I think you have to be really careful with when people start. You don't even know them, and they want to give you a gift. I don't. Yeah, I try to get those out of the house usually because I. They have power. Good point. They, yeah, I've had to. You don't know clear what's some. attached to it exactly. So I, I I've tend. Had to clear we, a I bunch tend, in the last. Oh, I tend. To, yeah, I'm gonna. We still six have six months, seven you, months. Yeah, you you want to get them out, of, especially it's if it's automatic. It's like oh yeah, because you, you learn something about somebody. Objects, you you know, curses are real. Oh, good point. Curses are real, and you know what happens is, like, you go into a place, you go, that's cursed. Oh, I don't believe in that. Then the guy gets run over by a, a truck or something. Um, we've seen that here in New, Me- in New Mexico. We have a lot of curses. We've got a lot of black magic. Mm-hmm. We've got a lot of witchy, witchy, witchy here. And there are certain places that are Indian cursed, okay? And, uh, and I know one place, and uh, this woman uh, ticked off these, I don't know, this other realm and uh, did some blasphemous things, and she didn't believe in any of that. Next thing you know, she's walking around in the cursed area. You know, she gets run over by a car and killed, and that was it. But it's because of it, 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 she just the, the, nothing like that exists. So I'm not going to pay attention to it. That an object could have a spin on it, or could have a spirit attached to it, or a uh, you know a thing could 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 mean something. You know, some I know people that will bless holy oil, make holy oil by praying over it, and then anoint the house around the perimeter. To keep, you know, and, and you go, well, gosh, that seems like some old superstitious thing they're doing. Not really. Because, see, all of it has to do with the mind. In their mind, they know they've done something. They've blessed that ground and that land with prayed over oil. It may not be a big thing to other people that go, oh, that's silly. That's ridiculous. That doesn't work. 
Uh, I'm sorry, but if if they whenever I pray, I believe it's real. If you pray over a cloth or over a a, a sick person or over a house or over whatever, um, things can get cursed. Things can carry a curse mm-hmm. to attack you. You can bring mm-hmm. a gift into your house that someone gives you, and it can be just right from the pits of hell. And you go, gee, ever since that thing's been here, we've been sick. What the hell? Mm-hmm. We better, mm-hmm. maybe that thing's evil. We better get rid of it. And then, hey, we're not sick anymore. What do you know? That, right? Yeah. I don't know, but then there's old age. <laughs> too. Okay, well, my guest has been Tina Plackinger, and we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. I've, it's just been a really fun time visiting with you, Tina, and just hanging out with the, with, with everybody. I love the pictures of you uh, in your body bodybuilding. Uh, oh, she was unbelievable. At the end of the book, there's a, a section where she's all pictures photographed with Don Rickles and various other celebrities, and she's uh, you know got the most gorgeous, beautiful body. And, and face. Uh, very strong, very strong woman. <laughs> Body and, and, and face yeah, as well. Yeah, just a beautiful person. Uh, the total package. And she has... Uh, and, and, you know, I thank you. Thank you. And and I found those online because, you know, everything had been taken from me. Uh-huh. Everything had been stolen out of my, my storage units and, and everything mm-hmm. was just gone. I, I feel like they, they try to erase you, you know. They just yeah. they, they want to erase you. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I found those. Those were just a, a few pickings that I grabbed uh, and, and, and put in there. And I was very grateful that the Lord just helped me do everything, Um uh, you, you know, last night I, I and I and and nothing is really original with me as far as things that I say and things that I I write. Uh, I I heard, I usually hear things somewhere and then I hurry up and I jot it down. But I heard something cool last night uh, on TV by an evangelist um, that uh, he was saying something about the word anxious. And in the word anxious, a lot of us have so much anxiety. And I had so much anxiety about doing this show. And I'm so happy <laughs> that the Lord helped me not. Yeah, not sit in my fear and not enjoy this. You know, I I, I, I was yeah. really afraid to do this. And anyways, in the word anxious is the letter I. I is right smack in the middle. But the word anxious ends with the word us. Yeah. And it's like, you know, when when at the end of my videos, I always say, you know, together we can do this thing. And it's so true. I sat for years with just I. It was just me. And I didn't talk to anybody. I you know, It was me and Jesus. But I didn't talk to anybody. Uh, and it's so nice to have a community. You know, the people on your channel are we uh, need more. Um, very warm. And once they get to know you, you know, it's it's like it's a family. And yeah. with that, you know, there's strength, and we can do this thing together. You know what? We're getting the wind at our back from the Lord, too. As the Lord brings, this is a little prophetic statement, but as the Lord brings judgment, to, and you can see it coming in, you know, and, and we need to be judged, by the way judgment coming in and then his lambs we're like the separated out we're we're not part of that we're separated but there's it's like a seesaw as they're going down in all their degradation and perversions and sin and embracing all the devil and everything else it's like we're that embrace god and we walk the path of god we're being boosted up right now and this is something that i identify with brother thomas who's been out he uh so far he unfortunately for uh some friends he's been <laughs> kind of accurate with the way things are going but he he got this call late in life to all of a sudden you know we were talking about the rising of the lambs and he would do uh he he would talk about that and then he uh all of a sudden got this inspiration almost like a second childhood to just go start this band and go out there and just get out there. You know what I mean? And rather that, as opposed to, well, I'm on this walk now. I'm a lamb. They're going to hate me. And you know what I mean? He had to face those fears and he's made a go of it. And it's been kind of fun to watch, uh, the rising of him and other people, not just him, but many other people, you know, trying different things. You writing the book is a rising of the lambs. Tina, same thing. Mm. And, uh, mm. so I guess what's yeah. happening with more communication, you know, a lot of, 
our people, I, I know there's an our people and a their people. I mean, I'm sorry, Lord, but it's there it, until that's proven otherwise. That's the way I kind of look at it. Um, it seems like a lot of our people are very, very creative, have lots of talents that have been squelched by the world. They haven't been able to show them or to ply the trade that they're capable of doing or to do the things they're capable of. They've been kept from being able to make, in many cases, make a decent living or be able to, to, to show forth what gifts they have. They've been squelched. They've been forgotten. They've been pushed down. They've been lied about. Their characters have been assassinated. They've, they've been really harmed by this world. And it seems like those ones that haven't given up, they've stayed on the path, they're kind of getting a blood. You know, the Lord's more powerful than the world, folks, and we're getting this kind of wind at our back at this point. And uh, the worlders, they're going down because, see, they've been involved in What I've really all enjoyed lately, sins, even though it's, it's killing babies, is how ev- Buggering the, truth, the truth is really starting to be like right in your it's face. It's everywhere, yeah. You know, you can't, you can't avoid the fact that say the democratic party in general uh is just fine with infanticide mm-hmm. you, you you know that they want to make that uh, legal don't forget, and uh yeah, don't forget the rhino i just call the point the, the, you know that the, point. there's it's, a lot of republicans that are for it too but what they do is they they act like they're not but they are they're snakes in the grass too you got to realize these politicians have been bought and paid for and they're they're basically what their goal is is to sell us into slavery and, you know, mm-hmm. Trump came along, as we predicted, there'd be a John Wayne come along and try to, and you can see the, how gang stocked he is, right? <laughs> oh my God. You know, do you know that with Trump right now, they're opening a whole new investigation, the, the Southern District of New York, every transaction that he's ever done. And do you know that Mueller is going to recommend? I heard a little in, something in, this morning. I haven't been able to find They want to indict on. the whole family, throw them all in jail. But, uh, uh for what? Don't quote me on this, but, is Weissman off the case? Off Mueller's no, he's on the team. The, I don't know. I just heard that this morning in passing, briefly, as we were rushing around getting ready. For yeah. The, no. All the I know show. is that they do all this stuff. You know, Podesta had these emails where he was talking about pedophilia and human and child trafficking, and even even allusions to child murder and wet work and Seth Rich and everything else. And instead of investigation, they talk about the emails being the reason Trump's in trouble when the Congress not once has ever addressed the content of those emails. Right. When all those emails have the same symbolism the FBI pointed out. And the Podestas get a pass. All of them. For the same thing that Manafort is accused of. Right. And Obama gets a pass. It's it's so sad on this Manafort sentencing because all that stuff has been brought up in the past and Rosenstein himself... uh, you know, right. dismissed it let me explain years this. ago. So let me explain the two-tiered system. All of what you see politically, this just underscores what I've been saying for years. The real rulers are the rulers of the same thing as if the Bible's been saying for years. Ephesians 6. These rulers and these high principalities are beyond the United States, beyond the rule of law. These people are all in, all Satanists. They're in the Satanic Club. They do all those things. They're guilty. They're a criminal organization. Totally, and they're above the law. And so we play rule of law. We play politics. But there's no reality to it. The reality is they run the show. We are still the serfs, the slaves, the, 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 mis- the unrepresented. And what we're trying to do, and we, what we hope to do, I, I don't see how you can do it without bloodshed, personally. That's, I've already kind of given up on this political thing. But uh, basically... Um, you know, people either fight for freedom or they won't. Freedom's not free. But these guys, these guys running all this, they are the same people that are running it back in Babylon. The same people that are running it back in the earliest day. These people, the you know, they're basically in the Cain Club. These people, their entire purpose is to destroy humanity. And uh, that's what, uh, when you sign on with the devil, you sign on to do what? When you sell your soul... You sign on to destroy your fellow human being. When you sign on with God, you sign on to help your fellow human being. Big difference. Mm. Big difference. Nicely put. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Nicely well, said. Here's one more I have. Mm-hmm. One more. One more little okay. Zephism. Satan <laughs> uh, looses us into bondage where Jesus binds us into freedom. Amen. 
Okay, that's that's Amen. all I have. I don't have any more. Amen. <laughs> wow, Tina, it's been so Amen. wonderful uh, talking with you, world champion. You world, world champion. champion. You. And she's rising again as an author. So uh, oh, it's been really... Thank you. Well, it's so nice to be with both of you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, I feel like I have two new friends. And, uh, you know, while I was writing this book, I wanted so much to email you and, and, and tell you that I was going to quote you and ask you if it was okay and all mm-hmm. this stuff. But I couldn't. Even though I'm watched heavily, I felt like I can't let the cat out of the bag because I have to protect this uh, project. I, I'm, you know, I'm Understood. just very glad that it actually got bound. It got published. I don't know what was worse, living it or getting the thing published. Honest to God, it was a, it was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of surus, a lot of turmoil in getting this thing published. But it is. It's done now. It's together and. And uh, it's a and great I, and I book. Thank Jesus for that. After you, uh, after you read, uh, the Trish book, has already the messed the book, of up, the book by the way. Um, You have the introduction, and and you read that introduction, and you're like, oh my gosh! I mean, it just takes a few minutes to read it, but you're like, holy moly, this is really. She's something. been through it all, and then it, you know, you definitely are 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 blessed to uh, to to. Go, th- you know. I'm. You say that I'm unusual in this. That most people just read the whole book from cover to cover. I, after reading the mm-hmm. intro, I go to the date, whatever date it is, and read it. And she reads it out loud to me, which I like. So, yeah. so we'll be driving, ah. and then she'll read it out loud, nice. and I'll be driving because I can't read when I'm driving, and then I get the benefit of it. And then she'll read Spurgeon to me. I go, I'll read that again. And we live on these affirmations. We live they, on these. They, they, yeah. You know, it's a, uh, a good way. I mean, it, if it's food, if you don't have uh, time to uh, read the Bible or uh, connects you with there's yeah. certain, you know, you can, you get the scriptures, you, 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 you put your little thing and you have a scripture to refer to, right. and then you can go mm-hmm. get your Bible or go online and get that scripture and yep. really take a look at it and. Oh, the Bible has saved me so many times where I got a, like someone would give me a scripture, I'd see one online, or I'd just go to the Bible and grab one, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, thank you, I'm now, yeah. re- it's like a reset button, you know? Yeah, I remember. A lot of Isaiah. And it like, memorize it. Oh, yeah. You memorize it, and then you just say it out loud throughout the day, and it changes the air because... Satan is the prince of the power of the air, and yep. I just I say scriptures out loud, and it just changes my atmosphere. It yeah. works. Yep. Those are our little tools that yep. we have to have. You guys, yeah, you, yeah, you need scripture the, is you, so. You valuable. all need a Bible, and I, you know, I have one that I can actually read without glasses. But the thing is so heavy; it's like carrying around the phone <laughs> the phone book. But you, I can read it without you know because I I'm not going to go look for my glasses. I know I have to have big print. You know what I mean? That's why, you know, having like a, a iPad or a laptop has been helpful because then I can see it in bigger print and then lit up, you know. Uh, but I, I like a book, too, to yeah. ha- have a book in my hand, have something not connected to like the Internet, to yeah. the beast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, all right. Well, Tina Plackager, pleasure. World okay. champion. And please stay right there. while oh, we the pleasure is mine. Thank you very much. Uh, Both of you. God bless you guys. God bless you. God stay right. Dog. Tina, Tina, Thank stay you. right there, okay? Tina, okay. stay right there while we wrap it out. All right, everybody. And there she goes. And she'll be right there. We're going to talk to her a little bit. We're going to close with a song. I pray. Uh, I plead the blood of Jesus over this entire show and over all of you and the protection of Jesus Christ and the Lord, the protection of God in Jesus' name over everyone that hears this show, both now and in the future, that you would be led, fed, guided, comforted, and that your anxiety would leave, that you would be healed of these PTSD, of this, of the devil's claws in your side, of all these snares and soul ties and all this awful stuff that that can happen, uh, that this path of the Lord will clean you all up, will clean us all up. So I I pray for a stronger faith for all of us and protection on this show and for all of you, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay.